Hi everyone, uh, my name is Desmond from Global Migration Solutions and thank you for joining us this morning. I would like to take an opportunity to also touch about the budgets that was just recently being announced by the Australian government mm -hmm. on the 9th of May. And this budget is giving us some directions on what is going to be like for the next fiscal year 2023, 2024, and some highlights on the potential changes that we are expecting. As what Ashley had just mentioned earlier, the Australian government is maintaining the, the planning level at 190,000. So this representing the total number of the application is going to be granted yeah, for each individual visa subclass as you are seeing here in front of you. Now, out of the 190,000, right, it is very obvious that the direction goes towards the skilled migration stream programs uh, of which that representing around 72%. So the 137,100 uh, places goes towards the skilled migration uh, programs. And uh, that covers uh, a small number of that includes the business innovation and investment. As you can see, 1,900. This is a drop from the previous year. So we are expecting a great competition for business owner and investor who is looking at in, uh, at in applying for these visa programs. But the good news is, this is a great opportunity for a professional uh, like yourself. Uh, if you're exploring to obtain your Australia PR for a while, the skilled migration programs has been very challenging. Yeah, until the new government, the Labour Party took over and has, has really looked into the direction of the programs. This is the reason number one. The reason number two is also because of the post-COVID, there is a labour shortage in Australia. And uh, we are talking about 500,000 yeah, labour shortages in Australia that the immigration, uh, the governments needs to immediately look into what they should be doing next to address the issue. Yeah, so good news. Uh, and the, the remaining close to about 30% goes to the family stream. So we have partner visa, we have parents visa, then, you know, and child visa. So this is, you know, the, uh, the directions, the overall direction. Now let's have a look at some of the potential changes, yeah? So we talk about the prioritizing the skilled migration and another good news that the government has made or intended to change is to increase the income threshold for temporary skilled migration uh, visa programs. And this is good news because the aim is to attract more skilled labor to address, to complement the state, the shortage of the labor market in Australia. And the government is planning to increase the salary from 53,900 to 70,000. So this is to attract more skilled labor market into Australia. And of course, given this, we haven't got a definite answer on what are the visa classes, that subclasses that is going to be affected or is going to be implied on, uh, on these changes. And we have wrote to the immigration waiting for their reply and answer on which uh, visa subclass that is going to be uh, uh, applied with the new changes. Yeah. And also good news on the international students. So we've effectively from 1st of July this year, the international students are allowed to work for a longer hours. At this moment, they, uh, they, 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 they used to be able to work for 40 hours uh, fortnightly, and this is going to be increased to 48 hours, effectively 1st of July. So good news. And next, for international students who, who is graduating from Australia, is also expecting to be able to have a longer visa 
which gives them a longer period to be able to stay back in Australia. And we call that post-study work rights visa, literally subclass 485, yeah, a graduate visa. Uh, and we're expecting for, for a degree graduate, they, have, they would have up to four years for master uh, degree graduates, they will have up to five years and the PhD holder would have up to six years of the rights to stay in Australia. Yeah. And uh, the government is also trying to address uh, some pathway, permanent residency pathway, especially for those temporary residence visa holders onshore in Australia at the moment. And that includes removing the restrictions on the subclass 186, the employer nomination scheme for the 482 visa holder. For example, right now, if you are under the short term, your occupation or your skill is under the short term list, you have a restriction to be able to renew your 482 visa for only one term. So, and the government is removing that. So they are encouraging literally those who is onshore and on the temporary residence visa holder to be able to apply for some sort of visa programs to gain the permanent residency. Yeah, so a lot of good news, including you know, uh, the government is allocating uh, quite a substantial amount of the money, uh, 75.8 million Australian dollar to expand the processing system and adding in more resources to improve the overall processing experience and the processing time. So these are all the key highlights and the directions that we are expecting to see this comes July. Yeah, let's have a look at uh, the being an Australia permanent residence. Yeah, and why is it that the Australia permanent residence uh, has been, you know, a, a demand for many clients and family members over the years? Literally being an Australia PR, you do have the almost the same rights as a, as a citizen. So people always ask, you know, being a PR, what is the difference than being a citizen? So the, the, the difference is very minimum. Literally, we are talking about being a PR, you are, in terms of the rights, you are enjoying the same and full, full rights as a citizen, but you don't have the vote, voting rights. Yeah, and you don't carry an Australian passport being a PR. Yeah, and another significant difference is should you want to be in the government position that allows you to hold guns, then you need to be a citizen. Other than that, you know, the benefits are the same. So let's, let's look into this benefits. So being an Australian PR, you do access to a Medicare benefits. So if you're going to the doctor, you're going to the hospital, for example, your cost of consultation, medications, are all going to be covered by the Australian governments. Yeah, we call that under, you call this under Medicare system. But of course, you do have the rights to be able to live and work anywhere in Australia. But not only Australia, the, the, the rights of being able to live and work do also extend to cover New Zealand. Because by virtue of being an Australian PR, you do have the options to take up a New Zealand PR status when you arrive at the New Zealand airport and complete the forms, you can apply on the spot to become you know, a New Zealand resident yeah, and enjoy the benefits as a PR in New Zealand. But of course, one of the important factors and the reasons that most of the clients embark on the Australia programs to become a PR has always been related to the children's education. So being a PR, you do enjoy the full rights for the uh, primary school and secondary school. Literally, you're paying zero. yeah. And when it comes to tertiary education, you're paying 30% as compared to an international student. Yeah? But of course, you know, all other welfares that comes under SOCS, uh, uh, that comes under Centrelink. So for example, during the uh, pandemic, there's a lot of benefits that was uh, being offered by the Australian government and 
as a PR, you do enjoy to every single benefits that's being offered. Yeah. So as a PR, you can also sponsor your family member. And then also you can choose to uh, take up the citizenship if you wish to. All right. So these are the few important uh, benefits that I would like to highlight. Yeah. Let's have a look at how do you obtain your PR? What are the common pathway? So today we are going to share about the general skill migration. Uh, later on, I'm going to pass over to Audrey, our associate director. Then we have the global talent independent. This is basically a program that's being designed as an extension from a general skill migration programs. Literally, if you are the expert of your industry, given that you fall within the certain sector and industry, and you, you are being recognized internationally, this is a program that you could potentially explore. Uh, we call that global talent independent. Employer-sponsored visa, if you are being offered a job in Australia and you fulfill the requirements, and the company qualified to be a standard eligible sponsor, then the company can apply for a visa and sponsor you uh, through this uh, pathway called employer sponsored. Then we have a family sponsored that includes parent sponsorship, uh, spouse visa, child visa. Then one of the popular programs that we are very specialized in has always been business innovation and investor stream. So you might be suitable for a few pathway, for example, but do talk to us. We are going to we are going to advise you on what would be the best pathway at your best interest. Yeah. And now without further delay, I'm going to pass over to Audrey to guide you through on the general skill migration programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Desmond. Over to you, Audrey. All right. Hi, good morning, everyone. So I think you had a very good overview on how this year is actually going to look great for the General Skill Migration Program. So let me just walk you through the basic um, requirements. You might already know this, but let's just go through together. So number one, of course, age is a important criteria. For the GSM program, you need to be below the age of 45, okay? Um, you need to meet a point test, uh, 65 tests, uh, 65 minimum point tests. But this is where also we come in to really advise you to, to be very frank about whether or not 65 would suffice for your profile or it would not be suitable for an invitation. So this is something we need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Do not be, do not assume that if you meet 65, you would make it just like that. So do speak to us more on, on how to be eligible. Next is you need to have an occupation on the Australian occupation list. There's, a, there's about 500 occupations on the list, which is divided into three different categories. There's a lot of occupations. Do not just think that it's just IT or engineers or doctor or nurses. It's a vast occupation list that Australia has. And number four, you need to have a minimum competent English. So how do you demonstrate a competent English? This is basically demonstrated through an English test, um, IELTS. IELTS is very popular, but these days PT English test is also very, um, has, has become more popular than IELTS, okay? Simply because of the way this English test format is. It's a fully computer-based English test, all right? That is fully marked by AI. And we have seen a lot of our clients actually doing well on this English test. So in order to get competent, you need to get 50 points in each of the components. There are four components that you're tested on, listening, reading, writing, and speaking. And competent equals to 50, which is band six in the IELTS English test. So again, it depends on your occupation, if competent would suffice or not. Number five, most importantly, you need to receive an EOI invitation to submit a visa. So you can get an invitation through various ways. It's either you get it independently through a state or through a family sponsorship. These are the basic criteria to just qualify for skilled migration. 
Now let's look into the types of visa classes. There are mainly three visa classes, which is the subclass 189 skill independent. This gives you a direct PR. Then we have the skill nominated 190. This also gets you a direct PR upon front. So what is direct PR is basically Australia's PR is valid for five years, right? So at the time of approval, even before entering Australia, you hold a permanent resident status in Australia. So obviously this visa is very, very valuable. It's literally gold, okay? And then we have subclass 491, skill regional nominated or sponsored. This visa gets you a TR first, but this temporary resident status can be easily converted into a PR. Okay, we'll go more into details of these three visa classes in the next slides. So skill independent 189, uh, it's a five years visa that allows you to live and work anywhere in Australia. There's no geographical restriction. How do you renew this visa? because this visa is only for five years. You basically would need to just stay cumulatively for two years in Australia within a five-year period. After the five-year period ends, you will then go on to another five-year, which is actually called a resident Britain visa RRB. Who qualifies for 189? It's only for occupations that are listed on the medium long-term strategic skill list. These are occupations that are pretty much deemed as high demand in Australia, such as highly skilled professionals like accountant, doctor, nurses, and also skilled workers such as chef, plumber, tiler. So the interesting part about this visa is as the migration scene was getting tougher and tougher, this visa was out of reach. Selections were, were almost at 1995 generally and for certain occupations like accountant it needed to you needed to have 100 points but with this recent change it's almost like at a reset right now I would I'd like to call it like almost at a reset there are invitations also taking place at 65 points okay so and this is possible because as Desmond mentioned, with the Labour Party coming in, there's a lot of priority given for skilled migration. There's a huge quota allocation given for this visa. For the skill nominated 190, this is also a direct PR, just like the 189. So basically, the 189 and 190 are visas of the same value because they are PR. But the difference is in the process of application, whereby you would need to have a state to nominate you. The state will need to first review your EOI, your expression of interest, to see if they're willing to offer you a nomination or not. Once they offer you a nomination, you then automatically get an invitation to submit a visa as well. It may sound like it's complicated, but trust me, this is this is the very usual way a general skill migration works. So don't do not be, you know, don't think that it's going to be so difficult to approach a state because that's what we are going to do for you. This is something that we do day in and day out. So um, there's been a lot of support from the state because the states themselves have also been given a high quota allocation by the federal government. And what's interesting about 190 again is um, it also got tougher prior to the pandemic. So if you're talking about 2018, 2019, the allocations for 190 were primarily given to those who were living in Australia, which we regard as onshore applicants. So when a client used to come to me in 2018 or 2019, I will always tell the client, hey, 190 might not be your might not be the easiest for you to get and you may need to look into another visa and that's how things were okay but after this shift 190 right now is a priority for offshore applicants so this is really a good time because the government himself have already instructed the state government that the quotas that they have should be given priority for offshore applicants and occupations for 190 can be from short-term lists. So this is where you have a lot of other occupations such as marketing, public relations, graphic designer, ICT project manager. Uh, what else do we have? Organization methods analyst, a lot, procurement. There's just a long list there. And 
someone with this set of skills can actually qualify for a PR in Australia. And that's very interesting. And you get five points for the nomination from the state towards your point test. Now let's look into 491. So the 491 works differently than 189 and 190, of course, because the 491 is given to you as a temporary residence first. So this temporary residency is valid for five years. And in this five years, you will need to fulfill certain condition in order for you to convert it into a full PR. First of all, let's see what this five years entails. This five years basically only allows the applicant to live, work, or study in a regional area in Australia. Okay, so this basically means anywhere in Australia except Sydney, Brisbane, and Melbourne. Okay, and here we are strictly referring to the city and the surrounding areas of the city. So this basically also, so, so do not think that you totally cannot go to Victoria because you can be in Victoria, but it's just that you cannot be in Melbourne, okay? It's strictly cities that are restricted under this visa. So how do you convert to PR? So in that five years, basically, all that you would need to do is demonstrate that you have earned a taxable income of currently at 53900 So this is the part where we need clarification. We are waiting for clarification from immigration. What is the taxable income bracket for a 491? Okay. But let's just go with 53900 first. Okay. So in these five years, you would need to demonstrate that you have three years of tax returns showing that you have earned an income of 53900 And this, when we say income, it's basically anything that you earn. It doesn't mean that you must be employed with a, with a particular employer. It also doesn't mean that you must be employed in your nominated occupation. It's anything. You could work as anything as you want. You could do two or three jobs if you wish to. You could run your own business and earn income from your business. It's very, very flexible, okay? So to me, as I was sharing with you in 2018, 2019, when the 189 and 190 was stuff, I always tried to share with my clients that this visa is really not that bad to obtain. You know, it's not, though it's not a PR. It's very easily achievable because in the five years, you just need to show this for three years of a taxable income, after which you can then convert it to a full PR. Okay, so once you get the full PR status, you can then live anywhere in Australia again, back to Sydney, Melbourne, or Brisbane. Okay, and because the government also encourages this visa, because the government wants the migrants to actually go and also develop and grow the other areas other than the three top cities, the government is awarding 15 points for this visa. Okay, so really not bad at all. So do check this visa out as well. So the 491 actually has two pathways. The first um, is basically either through a state or through a family. The, the requirements are totally the same. Family, I wouldn't touch so much uh, because this is not really a priority in terms of quota by the federal government. But if you do have a family, if you can look at the last point, the family could be your, your parents, grandparents, auntie, uncle, nephew, niece, cousins, living in regional area as well, then they could be a potential sponsor for you, okay? Where you can also get 15 points into your point test. So these are the two ways of applying for the 491 visa. One is through the state or one, the other way is through the family sponsorship. So this is just a quick summary about the benefits of the 491 because I always want to keep educating clients on how good this visa is. Number one, you qualify with 50 points because through a 491 nomination, you are given 15 points that makes up to be minimum 65. And there's wide range of regional areas available. Um, those days, uh, there were more restrictions whereby you cannot stay in Perth, you cannot stay in Canberra, you couldn't stay in Gold Coast, Newcastle, San, uh, Wollongong. These days, it's very straightforward. No Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne. The rest of Australia is accessible to you. Most importantly, it is still more valuable than like a graduate visa or even a work visa for the matter. See, even when you have a temporary work visa, 
um, it is at the discretion of the employer to get you the PR. But here, getting the PR is fully in your own control. All right. So this is a good way. Most importantly as well, Medicare. Okay, the free Medicare, the Desmond was talking about earlier. Usually, this is only for PRs, but under 491, because you're a taxpayer, you also get Medicare entitlement. Free primary and secondary school education is also applicable to all the holders of subclass 491. Generally, when we have a client who comes to us to migrate to Australia, they, I think 80%, they come with one main objective, which is children's education. Okay, they want to give children a quality education at a very affordable price. And that's exactly what you can get as a 491 visa holder. You also get full work rights. And though this is a professional skill migration, self-employment is totally permitted through this visa. So here's the latest processing time of these three different visa classes. Okay, so... Take note, priority processing for visa classes changes from time to time. But right now, the government is actually prioritizing 189. If you can see, 189 is usually processed within five months, 190 within 14 months, and 491 is taking 20 months. So with, with, the, with the arrangement to put in more resources into the visa processing, we expect these times to get better. Okay, so now let's look at the overview of skilled migration of how the process actually, how the entire process is. Number one um, is to get your skills assessment done. So this is where we will, so prior to how do we get your skill assessment done, we would first need to assess you, assess your CV and see what is your occupation, what points do you stand at. Once all this has been determined, we then start your skills assessment with the relevant authority. So for every occupation, there are different authorities that will need to undertake the work. So for example, if you're an engineer, your documents will be sent to Engineers Australia. If you're IT, it will be Australia Computer Society. And then if VETASES is an authority that handles a lot of other occupations such as marketing, public relations, graphic designer, chemist. So we will then, we will then do the full submission to the authority for you. And then you'll need to do your English test, okay? So the English test sometimes is a prerequisite for the skills assessment, such as if you're an accountant or an engineer, the English test needs to be submitted together with the skill assessment document. But for other occupations, the English test is only needed for the stage two. So this is again where we will plan together with you on how long it's going to, how long you should, how long do you have to produce your English test? So most importantly, you need to get your skill assessment done and English done to submit expression of interest. Expression, expression of interest is basically the heart of the application. Why is it the heart of the application? Is This is where basically you must receive an invitation to submit a visa. So when you come to the stage, we would then determine would we be submitting the expression of interest for 189, 190, 491, or even three at one go? So how we help our clients better here is basically, we want to submit as many as possible as EOIs to whichever visa that they qualify for. This is so that they expand their chances of getting invited at the fastest time. So once you've obtained an EOI invitation, you then move on to the visa application. Once you have actually crossed this, crossed this biggest journey of getting the invitation, getting a visa is almost, you're basically almost there like 98%. To us in our office, once the client has already been invited, it's, you have, you've almost like won the entire, entire game, just pending for medicals and police check. If there's no concern in your medic in your health and character clearance, getting a visa it's really not a problem at all. Okay, so these are basically the four the four steps of the visa application process. Once you've got your once you've got your visa approval, you will then need to make an initial entry into Australia. 
which you are given one year to make your entry, but that doesn't have to be your permanent move. So it's actually very flexible. This entire process of getting the visa from skill assessment till you get the visa itself is about, let's say, one to two years. Okay. Once you get your visa in about one to two years, your visa that you have is valid for five years. So you don't have to start planning on when you want to move to Australia right now when you start the process. But basically, when you start the process, you just need to start it when you're basically eligible and plan for your move much later. Because I know that making a decision on migration is not easy. There's a lot of things that you need to take into account. But don't worry too much about planning for the move as yet, but always plan to just kickstart the process. Just. So this is, the, this is basically the overview of how the skill migration works. Next, I'm just going to share with you um, the invitation trends that has been taking place um, over this past few months, which is very, very encouraging. So as you can see here, these are the various invitation cutoff points for 189, 190, and 491. So you can see that 65 points has been possible for engineers, lecturers, even external auditors and internal auditors. For 190, a lot of interesting occupations are listed. You can see copywriter, graphic designers being picked up at a bare minimum 65 points. Accountants are being picked at 85 and 80. This used to be, um, accountants used to be only picked at 100, 105. So dropping 20 points is very, very encouraging. And IT system engineer being picked at 65 points. These are basically things that we've not seen easily for the last five years. So the fact that we are seeing this now, it really shows a very good momentum in the program. So this is basically us celebrating our clients visa approval. So we usually have like a briefing session with clients when, 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 when before the pandemic, we used to do in-office sessions, whereby once a client has already obtained their visa, we like to invite them to come over for an initial landing briefing session that the Desmond usually has been doing. And we really celebrate it with the clients. We really miss having this. It's been silent for about three years now, and we wish to continue this sort of programs again together with y'all. Um, okay. So basically, the, for the next step, what I would like to share with you is before I pass on to Ashley for the Q&A, let, I just wanted to share that the migration system, the migration, there's a lot of talks going on about migration ever since this new government has taken over. Okay. One of it is improving the migration system as a whole. So a few things that they're talking about is there's not going to be a skill assessment and there's not going to be a occupation list. These are the news that we are hearing, but there has been no framework yet. Bottom line is this program is going to be designed to make it better to get more migrants into the country. However, what I would like to tell you is if you are actually eligible now, you should just make use of your, your eligibility currently and, and start the process when you are actually ready right now. Okay, Because as much as there's a program coming up, we're not too sure how exactly it's going to work for you. So don't wait for that. Contact us and let us know about how you uh, send us your CV and we will basically give you a very transparent advice on your exact eligibility. We will then have a Zoom session with you or a face-to-face -face consultation. And after the consultation, you can then decide to see if this is good for you and you're ready to take this forward. Okay, so that's it for me, actually. I hope the session was informative for you.